On Point with Craig's Investment Partners. The information provided here is general in nature. It's not financial advice. It doesn't take into account your financial situation, objectives, goals or risk tolerance. All investments are subject to risks and none are guaranteed. So before you make any investment decisions, we recommend you contact an investment advisor. For more information about our services in that regard, you can go to our website, which is craigsip.com. Welcome to On Point. I'm Mark Lister, Investment Director at Craig's Investment Partners, and I'll be talking about a range of topics, including economics, portfolio strategy, investor education, and anything else that's happening out there in financial markets. Morning all. Very much on the home stretch now, aren't we? Mid-December, just a couple of weeks to go, then we'll close the book on 2023, enter a new year, 2024. And despite the negative rhetoric, it has been a pretty good 12 months for investors. Surprisingly good, in fact. Conservative assets have returned to form. New Zealand corporate bonds are up a little more than 5% so far this year. That's fantastic. It comes on the back of two consecutive down years, down in 2021, down in 2022. So a return to form in that regard. Those returns do include the income received as well as the movement we've seen in prices. So uh, just bear that in mind when I say bonds have returned 5% or a little more than that, I'm talking about the total return, income plus capital movements. Share markets have also been strong. World shares have returned so far uh, 17.3% year to date. That includes dividends. So uh, that's a total return as well, but that's well above the long term average, which is probably somewhere at a guess in that 8 to 10% range. The two markets that have led the way have been the United States and Japan. Uh, the US is up almost 22% this year, and Japan is up a little more than 25%. And obviously, in the US, it's been the technology stocks that have been particularly strong, uh, which is an interesting comparison with Japan, the other star performer of this year, where you have seen a much broader rise across the market. The local share market has been a notable laggard. You know, most markets have been up. Uh, the European market, uh, the Australian market haven't performed as well as Japan and the US, but they've still been up solidly. Although our little market here in New Zealand, uh, the NZX50 index is essentially flat with two or three weeks to go. That's not a huge surprise. Our market is heavily weighted to defensive businesses that pay attractive dividends, things like real estate, infrastructure, utilities, and those sectors are particularly sensitive to changes in interest rates. They, they do well when interest rates are low or falling, and they do tend to face more headwinds than most when interest rates are rising, as they have been uh, for the best part of the last two, two and a half years. So for our market to start performing well again, we might need to see some respite on the interest rate front. And the good news is that in the eyes of financial markets, that will happen next year. Current market pricing suggests that we will see the first cut in the official cash rate in somewhere around the middle of the year, July, maybe August, which isn't that far away. We'll, we'll go on holiday soon. We'll come back in late January, early February and get back into the swing of things. And July or August uh, will just be around the corner. In other markets around the world, such as the United States, the UK and Europe, markets are pricing the first interest rate cuts to come even earlier than that. Uh, for the most part, it's, it's more more sort of second quarter, you know, around that April, May, June zone. Our Reserve Bank would beg to differ with those forecasts. It sees another hike as more likely than a cut in 2024. And our Reserve Bank has been very much pushing the message of higher for longer and guiding the market to not expect any cuts until sometime in 2025, you know, middle of the year or thereabouts. So this will be an interesting one to watch. And I think the interplay between inflation, migration and the labour market will be a really crucial determinant of who is right. Are financial markets right and we'll get cuts in the middle of next year? 
or is the Reserve Bank right? And that won't happen until the year after that. So the next inflation report, the next consumer price index, CPI report, is out in late January, so we won't have to wait too long for that. Recent readings have come in below expectations. Uh, the September quarter came in at 5.6% annually and the Reserve Bank was expecting 6 So they have come in lower than expected and that January report will cover the, the final three months of the 2023 calendar year. So we'll be watching that one. Surging migration uh, is something that could change the landscape, even though we've seen recent readings come in lower than expected. And that is one of the Reserve Bank's big worries. And we got some migration data this week and it's still looking super strong. That's uh, a real double-edged sword from an economic perspective and from a Reserve Bank inflation sort of nervousness perspective. Strong migration is great for economic activity, and to be honest, it is probably saving us from falling into a technical recession right now. But on the other side of that coin, it does increase demand and it does uh, put upward pressure on inflation. So that's something the Reserve Bank has been very worried about. Then again, uh, labour shortages have been a really big part of our inflation problem. And an influx of new workers is helping us solve this. You think about unemployment and it's increased from 3.2%, which was the lowest that we'd seen since the early 1980s. That's where unemployment fell to in 2022. Uh, and now it's sitting at 39 So it's risen from 32 to 3.9. And a large part of that increase has been due to stronger migration, which has taken the edge off wage growth. Wage growth has been incredibly strong, which is a good thing uh, because lots of jobs and lots of segments of society have deserved higher wages, but we know that wage inflation begets broader inflation. So when you start to see wages grow up, that tends to push inflation up more broadly. So anything that will ease the labour market up a little bit and will uh, see less pressure on businesses that are finding it really difficult to hire staff and they're forced to uh, poach other staff and give them pay rises or defend their their own staff from others trying to steal them. Uh, anything that sort of changes that dynamic and takes the pressure off wage growth is likely to reduce broader inflation pressures. And that should be something that gives the Reserve Bank a little bit of breathing space. So this is something we're watching very closely too. The labour market, migration and inflation, because they all do have a big impact on what the Reserve Bank will do next and when they will do it. We'll get an updated labour market report in February and that will be just before the first Reserve Bank meeting of the year. The Reserve Bank also meets in February, that's when we'll get the next OCR decision, that's when we'll get the next set of monetary policy statement forecasts, but earlier in that month we'll get an unemployment report. So we can look ahead to early next year in New Zealand and in January you'll get that inflation report in February you will get that labour market report. Internationally I think politics will be a major theme uh, in the coming 12 months and the main event will be the US election that is on the 5th of November next year and it's shaping up as a rematch between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, uh, just like 2020, Biden versus Trump. That would be the first presidential rematch we've seen since 1956. And uh, it's not guaranteed. Uh, we'll wait for the primaries in January, and I think it's uh, Iowa that's the first one, and then New Hampshire, and then they sort of follow on after that. But everything points to it being Biden versus Trump. More often than not, the incumbent party wins. And when you've got a sitting president that is running again, because remember in the US you can only do two terms, so uh, you can't run and keep running and keep running. You only do those two terms, uh, then you've got to sort of move on. And when you do have a sitting president that is running again, like Biden will be next year, the odds rise even further for the incumbent party to win. They rise to almost 70%. And I went back and looked at the last 200 odd years of elections to, to figure, that, figure that out. So Biden is absolutely in the box seat. 
And that's another reason why the Democrats are not going to change candidate. You know, a lot of people saying, well, geez, he's 81. Is it time for him to move on? The Democrats will not change their candidate because the odds of them winning when you've got uh, the sitting president re-running, um, because they're a known quantity and people are very comforted by just more of the same rather than sort of something new coming in and adding that layer of uncertainty, um, Biden's very much in the box seat. And, and, and I find it very hard to see the Democrats going with anyone else, despite sort of uh, his age and so forth. However, a real spanner in the works could be the economy. And this is important because although Biden is probably in that pole position, his approval ratings are extremely low. He, he is not popular. High inflation, the cost of living crisis, uh, a range of other things are keeping people uh, quite unhappy. So his approval ratings, ratings are very low. And if you get the US economy stumbling, or if it falls into recession even, I think things would quite quickly swing back into Trump's favour. And that's when you look at the odds or the polls, a lot of people are actually picking a Trump victory. I saw a survey of fund managers that was out uh, just in the last few days, and a majority, only a slim majority, but a, a majority nonetheless, were actually picking a Trump victory. And the reason they think that is that there's uh, still a lot of people that think the economy might have quite a tough year. And if that happens, people tend to blame the government and vote for the other team. And uh, during the Trump era, when he was president, the US economy was actually in very good shape and performing well. And so a lot of people still remember that. So it'll be a really interesting year. And that will be a, a key event um, in, in November 2024. Earlier in the year, much earlier, so in the first couple of weeks of January, in fact, we will have the Taiwanese election. And that's worth keeping an eye on too. Uh, obviously, a lot of tension between uh, China and Taiwan and the US and China and lots of talk about sort of geopolitical risks on that front. The two leading opposition candidates in Taiwan have formed a joint presidential ticket, which means they're going to be running together. As, as a team rather than as individuals. And what that means is the the likelihood of a pro-mainland government being inaugurated, voted in, and then more inaugurated in May is much higher. At, at the moment, uh, the ruling, ruling party and the president is pro-independence, and there's not a great relationship there with, with China. But if those two leading opposition candidates can... And, and they're probably still against the odds, but put them together and their odds increase. If they could take control, that would mean you have got a pro-mainland ruling party. And that would be positive from a financial markets perspective because it would allow China to make progress integrating Taiwan without the use of force. And so that would the reason that would be good is because it would obviously reduce some of those near-term geopolitical risks. So that's something to watch as well. We've got the US election late in the year, but very early in the year, while most of us, uh, certainly me, are still on holiday, we'll have that presidential election in Taiwan, which will be interesting to watch. So you bring all this back to financial markets and always a real challenge to predict what's ahead. Next year will be no different. I think there's a couple of real positives. Lower inflation, uh, you're seeing lower inflation everywhere, uh, with the exception of Japan, which is sort of another camp, but in Europe, inf uh, headline inflation's in the mid twos, in the US it's in the low threes, here in New Zealand and Australia it's still higher than we would like, but at least it's coming down, so lower inflation and in all likelihood falling interest rates or at the very worst interest rates that are not going up anymore but in the eyes of financial markets as I said uh, interest rates will be falling next year and personally I believe that to be the case as well. Lower inflation, falling interest rates, unambiguous positives for investments uh, and for financial markets especially for fixed income bonds. So I, I think fixed income is highly likely to have another solid year because you've got yields that are at very attractive levels. You've got uh, central bank interest rates that are probably at the top and potentially going lower. So I think the backdrop is very favorable for fixed income. And that's a place that people should be uh, looking 
particularly for investors that are quite focused on income and are looking for predictability and stability of returns. Great opportunities there. Best that we've seen in more than a decade, in fact. When it comes to shares, as always, the outlook is murkier. And, and I think that's because you've got positives and negatives. You've got that tailwind of easing monetary policy. You know, if, if interest rates and inflation are coming down, that's good for shares as well, uh, very much so. However, uh, that could go hand in hand by slower and weaker economic growth and activity. And while it's far from inevitable, many of those classic economic indicators that we all watch still point to recessionary risks on the horizon in some economies, you know, like the like the United States. And it's really difficult to avoid recessions of some magnitude when you've had interest rates rise as sharply as they have. You know, in the US they're at five and a half percent and it was it was only sort of eighteen months ago that they were at zero and you had all the QE and so forth. So it's been a, a very rapid rise and that is almost always followed by a slowdown or a recession of some magnitude. Not always. Uh, there's a couple of instances where we've seen those uh, interest rates rise and there was no recession. I think 1983 was one example, 1994 was another, but it was a little bit different back then. You didn't have inflation that was as high as, as, as it has been today and you didn't see interest rates rise by the same sorts of magnitude. So the odds are still against us in terms of looking back at history and, and trying to figure out what the playbook is and how things might play out. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, people have been talking about a recession for ages and it hasn't come, so it's probably not going to come this cycle. Well, no, don't be too complacent because the typical lag is about two and a half years from the first rate hike in the recession, and it's about... 12 months or thereabouts after interest rates move into restrictive territory, uh, which is when they remove, uh, move above that neutral steady state rate and actually start impacting on economic activity. And when you look at where we're at this cycle, those signposts probably point us to about now-ish, to be honest, or early 2024. So we're not we're not really behind schedule. You know, a lot of economists and a lot of financial historians would look at this current cycle and say everything is still on track for that recession to hit at roughly the usual time. The labour market's also a really important indicator, and I talked about the labour market here in New Zealand and how it, it uh, is really important for the inflationary backdrop, but it's also really important for what happens in an economic sense. And in the US, which is the biggest economy in the world, and that's the one that we all focus on because it matters the most, uh, unemployment has risen from 3.4% in April to 3.7% today. So not a massive rise, you know, it's 0.3 of a percent. It was 3.9 a month ago. So it's actually come down in the last month, which is good. But even modest increases in unemployment usually cause recession, sometimes only mild ones, but still recession. So we need to watch this really closely uh, because th there's never been a time since World War II that we've seen unemployment rise, you know, even half percent really, uh, without there being a recession. So we don't have a huge amount of breathing space. You know, if unemployment in the US does push into the, the low fours next year, and it's been generally trending higher, then you would say that that, that could tip the economy into a recession. So we, we just need to be a little bit careful about uh, assuming that we're out of the woods. Um, I don't think a recession is an inevitability. Let's let's make that clear. Uh, it would be rare for us to avoid one at this point, looking back through history. However, it's really important for us to also note that it's been such an unusual period since the, the pandemic, since COVID, that if there was ever going to be a time that the traditional signposts were going to be proved wrong, it will probably be now. So, you know, it's it's far from inevitable. You know, to be honest, my personal view is that it's sort of sitting somewhere around that 50-50 call. 
uh, in terms of the odds. So really hard to say which way it'll go. Uh, those aren't bad odds, to be honest, of us pulling off a soft landing or, or getting out of this without a recession ensuing, um, especially when you consider that it's not something we've seen very much at all through history. However, when we're thinking about our investments and we're thinking about that decision between bonds and shares, We've got to think about what markets are pricing in. I think when you look at the share market and you look at how good a performance it's had this year, particularly in the United States, um, the market is increasingly starting to price in or be priced and set up to expect that soft landing. So that means if you think the odds are actually somewhere around 50-50, uh, but then you look at the market and you think, well, the market's probably pricing it into the tune of 70, 30 or even 80, 20. You're probably then are going to believe that there's a better trade off when it comes to fixed income. And I think that's why fixed income is probably the asset class that I think uh, has a clearer path forward. So that's that's sort of where we're at. We'll be monitoring all the data and all the indicators and, you know, uh, all of us that watch markets closely and think about these issues will will reserve the right to change our mind uh, as as new information comes to light, just like central banks do. But anyway, if you did get that negative outcome uh, in terms of an economic slowdown or even a recession, that would probably mean that the analyst forecasts for earnings growth that we've got out there at the moment for 2024 are probably a little too high because analysts are, in a bottom-up sense are looking for earnings growth next year at a global level of about 11%, which is, isn't bad. Uh, earnings forecasts are higher in Japan and emerging markets. They're a little bit lower in the UK. Europe, Australia, and certainly here in New Zealand and in the US, there's probably sitting around that 11% mark. And if we were to have a recession, even a mild one, you'd probably say you're not looking at plus 11%. You're looking at something that is lower than that and possibly or probably even negative. So if you did that, get that sort of outcome, and it's not guaranteed, but I think you know always important that we think about the what could go wrongs and prepare for them, a rough patch like that would probably see larger companies outperform smaller ones. Larger companies tend to be more resilient. They tend to be the ones that can hold their own better than smaller ones, which are often riskier and more sensitive to changes in economic conditions. I think you'd see those high quality defensive companies and growth stocks hold up better than uh, the more cyclical parts of the market because that parts of the market are, while cheaper, you know, value stocks and cyclical stocks are often cheaper they are more sensitive to changes in the economy. So I would be sticking with the defensive stocks and the good quality growth stocks. And when you think about regions, that backdrop sort of brings you back to the United States because the, the sector makeup of the US market and the industries that tend to dominate uh, probably play into the hands of the United States. And uh, at this point, you're probably saying, well, geez, why, why is he talking about the US in such a positive light? Hasn't had a great run in 2023. It's been one of the best performing markets, up 20% plus. Uh, that's true. But remember that many sectors have been flat this year. Uh, outside of the uh, the tech stocks and the AI exposures, artificial intelligence, a lot of the market has been pretty flat or even negative, whether it's consumer staples or utilities uh, or healthcare or industrials. Those parts of the market haven't performed nearly as well, uh, and some of them are actually unchanged or even down. So there are still a lot of opportunities out there in the US, and it's, it's incorrect to look at the index such as the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones or the NASDAQ uh, and, and assume that the whole market has done as well as that. So there, there are still opportunities. And I think even when you think about uh, the high-flying tech stocks, there are some reasons to still be positive on those. I know they've had a great run. I know on some metrics they still look quite expensive, but you know, they will drive genuine productivity gains on the back of developments uh, in AI. And while that could be a story for 2025 or 2026, you know, because it won't happen overnight, I think investors will continue to uh, give those companies um, the benefit of the doubt or, or price them higher in the lead up to that period. So they, they could still they could still do okay. I would be a bit hesitant to just uh, sell them and reinvest elsewhere 
because they've had such a strong run. I think you really do, you really do want to hedge your bets at a time like this. Currencies, uh, if we're thinking about a more difficult year in 2024 and thinking about how we can uh, mitigate some of the risks in that regard, the US dollar is typically one of the more resilient currencies during any period of weakness. So I think that's probably another reason why local investors should maintain a healthy exposure to the world's biggest share market, which is the US. Uh, that US dollar does tend to perform well when you're facing difficult times or uncertain times. And while we're talking about currencies, I would just keep an eye on the Japanese yen uh, next year as well. That, that's absolutely one to watch closely. Uh, that is the one central bank in the world that hasn't really done much at all on the interest rate front. They still have negative interest rates. Um, and they've really got to play catch up and start tightening monetary policy in the same way others have. Uh, maybe not to the same degree, but compared to where they are now, they will have to make some moves because inflation is, is above 3% now in Japan, which is you know, where it's been for, for over 12 months, so it's above target. Core inflation has been sitting above 4% for the last six or seven months, and that's something you haven't seen since the early 1980s. So while other parts of the world are seeing inflation come down, uh, Japan is seeing the highest inflation that it's seen for some time. So I think their central bank will be forced to normalise interest rates and, and tighten monetary policy and probably drop those yield curve control policies they've had in place. And that is something that could push the yen higher compared to other currencies. Um, so that's that's a bit of the watch this space as well. As far as the New Zealand share market goes, I actually think it's quite well positioned heading into the next year. You know, we've got a lot of uh, stable defensive businesses that do well during difficult periods. Uh, we've got a high sensitivity to interest rates and if you do see the OCR start coming down next year, if you see term deposit rates follow, then I think that plays right into the hands of many of our companies that are good quality, they're well managed, they've got low debt levels, they pay highly attractive um, dividend yields and they, they would be the right place to be against that, against that sort of backdrop. And remember, we've lagged most other markets. You know, we were down in 2021, only marginally. We were down in 2022, like everybody was. And this year, we've done nothing. You know, we've just gone sideways, whereas you look at other parts of the world and many markets have risen. So I think the local market is actually quite well placed and uh, it is, it is the bar isn't as high as it is in some places. So I think our market could be a better performer than many people believe in the year ahead. So I guess looking back on uh, this year, uh, it's been much stronger than many predicted. You know, many people wouldn't have predicted uh, returns to be as good as they have. And as long as you've been well diversified, you, you should have had a good year. I think the only reason you wouldn't have had a good year is if your share portfolio was uh, very dominated by local stocks and you didn't have much international exposure. If you had a, a well diversified share portfolio, um, you should have done fairly decent uh, because many parts of the world have outperformed what we've seen here in New Zealand. And anyone with fixed income uh, might still be might still be hurting from the, the moves we've seen since the, the 2021 era when interest rates were very low and some of those bonds are still looking like they're underwater. But compared to a year ago, uh, you, you're probably in a much better space and certainly well positioned for the future. So we're not out of the woods yet. It's definitely too early for the central banks to do a victory lap. You know, we don't know if we have completely got inflation under control and managed to uh, raise interest rates to where they are and normalise things without causing a sharp economic slowdown. Time will tell. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think we should be too negative. You know, Being too cautious is just as risky as being overly optimistic. But touch base with your advisor if you do want to think about individual companies or funds or investment trusts or whatever that will position you accordingly 
I think adopting a, a defensive stance is what we should be doing, but that does not mean running for the hills. You know, it doesn't mean sitting in cash. It doesn't mean being too afraid to take any action or do anything, uh, because things might well turn out to be better than many people expect. Mm-hmm.